He is Director of Business Development at PRISM SPC, a company dedicated to digital privacy and security, and a mentor for the Mozilla Open Leaders Program. Sean founded Yale Privacy Lab in 2017 and is an active member of Make Haven, a local nonprofit makerspace where he implements Freedom Box GNU Linux servers. So without further ado, I'll, the stage is yours. Great, thanks. Thank you all for coming. I know it's after lunch, so uh, you know everybody's got their glucose going now, which is good. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm at Yale Law School. I am not a lawyer. Um, and I do cybersecurity and tech work for them. So that's what we're going to be talking about, of course. I'm also at Purism. So um, wonderful company. You guys should all check out Todd Weaver's talk after this um, and, and check that out. Um, for those of you who are following along, if you go to this uh, shortened URL here, frama.link, um, that'll actually bring you out to an etherpad. Um, so if you want to, and this is for the people on the stream too, of course, if they want to put questions in there, do introductions, or just put their information down because they want to stay in touch, um, that would be great. And then also there's a link to the presentation in that etherpad. So if you want to download the presentation, that's where it is. All right, chicken, chicken, chicken. Um, this is my chicken tax. For those of you who are not at the chicken thing and who are here, um, these are my wonderful chickens. And I'm just giving you a little taste of, you know, chicken world. Um, they're wonderful and cute when they're small, and they are great when they're older because you get fresh eggs every morning. So, All right, so uh, I'm not going to go into who I am again, but um, if anybody wants to talk after this about ultrasonic spying via microphones, I would really like to talk about that with people here. So, so um, basically, we convinced a law school, Yale Law School, to um, allow us to do a cybersecurity course that was tech-focused completely. Um, so very little policy, very little regulation. Of course, we talked about those concepts, right? But mostly showing free software. Um, so we had uh, as much free software as we could pack into this thing because we take as a very basic principle that privacy and security require free software. Uh, and that's something we definitely pushed quite a bit. Um, I know this is GitHub. We'll get it on GitLab, I swear. But um, if you guys want to check out some of our work, uh, it's there. So. And what is our pedagogical approach? So um, we do hands-on practical learning, um, simple exercises, right? There's a huge range of stuff when we're talking about cybersecurity. Um, and really, we had to start from ground zero. So the folks who were in this class, it's about a 60-40 female to male ratio, um, which is great because we need more women in tech. Um, and uh, these folks are lawyers or people who are prospective lawyers, right? Uh, they don't know what an operating system is in the way that we do or have learned ourselves um, as hackers and free software folks. Uh, they don't know what a network really is. Many of them only use a mobile device um, and have been kind of forced into using 90% MacBooks in the environment we're in, um, just for class. And then when they're out of that world, they go right back into using the mobile phone primarily and television. That's pretty much it. So we had to do a lot of work really showing the basic conceptual stuff that we take for granted at a conference like Libre Planet here. Uh, we use single board computers. These are Raspberry Pis. Um, I know there are other ones out there that don't use patent encumbered stuff, but these are the ones that the school provided for us. Um, nice, pretty cases for those. And uh, having the ability to have a device like that in your hand is really a big part of round one, right? Trying to break down that conceptual barrier of what a computer is. We can po point to one of those single board computers and say, this is the kind of thing that is in your phone. Your phone is a computer. This thing is a computer. You can dial into this thing remotely over the network. Um, we got them to assemble uh, on the first day, put the thing together, which is always very fun. Um, we did some basic, basic command line stuff, dropped everybody into the deep end immediately. So um, from a pedagogical standpoint, that was risky, but I think it needed to be done. Um, and the professor I was teaching with, uh, Scott Shapiro, also thankfully agreed with me. Um, and it really paid dividends, actually, to get the folks in the class out of their comfort zone early. 
Um, so we had them control it with uh, SSH, and then we talked about the kernel, talked about user space, um, different admin root access, privilege escalation, that kind of thing. So here's our ideal classroom network, right? It's a nice diagram, pretty-ish. Um, we hooked up these uh, Raspberry Pis to just a basic switch, um, and then those would be hooked up to um, Linksys routers, which were running DDWRT, and then uh, whatever, whether they're using Mac or Windows, unfortunately at the beginning we didn't have any GNU slash Linux users, although we did end up with a few after the class, which is great. Um, but we wanted to make sure that they could dial into these, these little machines. This is what it looked like in practice. <laughs> so <laughs> a little different. I tried to take this photo without too many people there and then and obscure the faces, of course, but um, that's our TA, Lauren uh, Weisinger, uh, playing with the, uh, the router and trying to get things to work. Uh, basically, every morning, we'd have to come in an hour, hour and a half early and just test everything out. So um, it was interesting, to say the least. Uh, on a university network, things don't always work the way they should. Um, we air gap this as much as possible, but when we needed to get packages, for example, um, we would have to hook it up to the network. Um, so there was a lot of switching around. And for some reason, Yale loves these new desk things. They don't want to have a, a flat desk in the middle. They have this like pit. So if your pen rolls off the table, you've got to walk all the way around and go into this center area, which is a little weird and kind of challenging for what we were trying to do. But hey, you do what you can. So this is the Raspberry Pi with a little LED screen hooked up to it. Um, this is something I recommend for anybody who's doing single board computing, um, especially on large networks. Um, some kind of visual output of simple things like the IP address of the device is really, really helpful. Uh, the MAC address is not on the board for these, or the default MAC address is not on the board for these. There's just nothing. Um, so if you don't have a display that can give you some output and your DHCP lease changes, right, you get a new IP address, students lost, can't dial into the machine, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're dealing with networks like the one we have here at MIT or wherever where you have leases changed all the time, you know, that's an issue. So I recommend that for the Freedom Box, for, for whatever you're doing. Um, if you can get some visual output, it's really helpful to new users, but also who wants to have to try to figure that out? <laughs> um, the command line interface we used was actually something called Hyper. I know everybody is a fan of electron-based apps in the room. Uh, no. The nice thing about Electron, of course, you know, whatever uh, kludge you think it is or isn't, um, is that you can get these uh, types of apps across operating systems. So our Windows users would be able to use this, not get it confused with PowerShell or what's left of, you know, command.exe. Um, our Mac users wouldn't be dropping into their shell, right, uh, and then screwing up their local system. Um, so I do recommend Hyper if you guys need to get people into the free software world using the command line for exercises. This is a great one. And then kind of activity we did, of course. So, um, you know, we opened up the, the command line, we do SSH, we type in a password, blah, 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 connect. This kind of thing, which again, we take for granted because we're used to talking to machines, right? We're used to telling them what to do over the network. But this is huge. I mean, there's like audible gasps when you do this for the first time with people who have never even tried something like this. And of course, you know, building up that confidence too that, you know, people have the autonomy and the, the ability to do this with free software is really, really important. So um, we went through all the boring stuff about permissions and so on, normative structure of a network. This is where things get interesting, right? For the first time in week four, we're actually now able to talk about cyber attacks that people hear about in the news. That's always very interesting because you hear that there's these internet attacks, you hear about cyber war, you know, these folks are um, trained to think about these things from a policy and a regulatory standpoint. But when you can just do a DDoS attack in the classroom with them, when you can do a man in the middle using a device like this, um, then you can show the packets coming across the network. You can say, here's what encryption does, right? And then you can do that all with free software, of course, and just reinforce the entire time um, why it's valuable to do that. Um, some examples from the classroom, and I swear I was there. The guy who takes the photos always ends up not in the photos. The next time I'm going to have to do the selfie thing. Um, 
just not my generation. But um, this is us doing a DDoS against a mirror of a website. Um, this is Metasploit. Um, the Metasploit toolkit, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, has all kinds of very, I don't want to say weaponized, but easy to use um, exploits. And they're so easy to, to call up uh, pretty much everything that you would need for pen testing a network, as well as just demonstrating what's out there. If you want to show somebody in real time what a phishing attack is, there's a social, um, social media toolkit in here where you can just create a fake Facebook front end. Um, this stuff is really easy to pull up. And for anybody trying to teach those concepts, because the world we're in now, security and privacy are on the front page every day, right? It's such a wonderful in to be able to get people who are interested in that, interested in free software. And giving them this, um, you know, not necessarily talking about freedom up front, but as the first thing, talking about security and then privacy first, you know, is a good way to do it. This is us doing a DDoS, basically. And then we did a pwn this pump pumpkin uh, uh, attack, which was great. Um, this is obviously a seasonal thing. We put a Raspberry Pi in a pumpkin with these LED indicators. That's great. Um, all this stuff is documented, by the way, in the, in the presentation if you want to check it out. And there's our TA just showing people how to connect to it. Um, the task here was there was a, a weak root password for SSH. Um, so they had to brute force or do a dictionary attack against the, um, against the password. And then when they connected, they had to either turn off the LEDs or make them turn green. So it was fun. And we gave, you know, little tidbits of information. You can check out that exercise there. There's uh, Scott Shapiro showing Metasploit and stuff. Um, how wonderful it is, uh, can I tell you, to see on the, bo on the board there, you know, all that tech stuff in a place like a law school. Um, it's a lot of fun, so. And then secrecy, encryption, we try to separate those concepts out, right? Why would you want to use this stuff? Here's how it works. Um, there's a fear of math out there, a uh, very strong one. So pedagogically, again, we had to kind of get around that barrier through example. Um, and then what we found actually was that a lot of folks were more interested in the mathematical concepts um, than we would have ever guessed. Uh, so they were asking us questions all the time about the algorithms, the encryption, uh, even though we thought that would be the boring stuff that they wouldn't want to talk about, right? We did anonymity in the dark web and lucked out. The day we were doing it in class, we had Sherry Steele uh, from the Tor Project on campus for another reason. So she came in, sat in on the class. We demonstrated Tor in the classroom. Um, this whole thing about the dark web being scary and all these ads now on you know TV that are ha having people like uh, Rudy Giuliani, you know, saying, "Oh, fear the dark web," you know. Um, it's something we have to talk about, right? It's something we have to show people how to use. Um, and we have to be honest about it. So we did talk about cybercrime as well. You know, one of the ways you get around the issue of people always going, well, the dark web's this deep, terrible thing. You shouldn't be introducing people to it. As you say, well, this technology exists. It's in the real world. Whether you like it or not, you know, there are going to be people using it for nefarious purposes, as well as tons of other wonderful, you know, wonderful things, right? censorship, circumvention, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and being honest and giving some of those examples, I think, is the best way to get around that, that fear. Um, so where does free software fit in? So why am I talking about this here, going through the syllabus and so on? It's not a guarantee of privacy, but it definitely is a prerequisite. And uh, from a licensing standpoint, we have to constantly hammer this home. Um, I know that makes me Captain Obvious, <laughs> and in this room, preaching to the choir is, you know, is what it is. But um, just because these concepts are familiar to us doesn't mean that they don't need to be explained. Um, and you get a little sharper, too, in your own arguments, right? If you want to go out there and get people actually using this stuff, being in our world, so to speak, um, knowing what the common sense sort of uh, questions you get back, the best way to approach and pitch this sort of thing, um, is really important. So, got a few examples here from our chain of trust uh, class, so that you can see the kind of thing we were we were teaching. We talk about verifiability, huge, right? Um, 
talk about preferred form. That's the thing you know you usually only hear the lawyers talking about. But you know we give them a little tidbit because we have people who are interested in intellectual property as well, right? Uh, talk about reproducible builds, which we all hope we can realize soon. Um, that's great. Um, we get around the terminology problem <laughs> as quickly as possible. And to me, the thing that's important here is that we don't have to go into the whole history and all the fighting and all the, you know, whatever, all the, the group problems and clashes. We can just say, hey, open source is a term you've probably heard for this stuff. Um, and we're going to call it free software because we're emphasizing the freedom. Copy left, another thing we really need to keep in mind, um, and I know Richard, when he was talking earlier about the problems with GitHub, uh, we have a whole generation of folks now who have gotten into open source through platforms like GitHub, and they just stick the MIT expat license on everything. Um, so emphasizing the importance of copy left specifically, and the importance of replenishing the commons and actually making sure that you're paying it forward but doing it from a security standpoint and a verifiability standpoint is really, really important. Um, if you want a piece of software that you don't have to be afraid is going to get locked down further down the line, you want it to have strong copy left, right? So that's something we definitely tried to push. Um, and then why I talk about licensing at all in the context, um, in cybersecurity, courses and in all the trainings to be a pen tester and all those certifications, you're not going to see anybody talk about this, right? Um, but it is an essential aspect of how to evaluate the trustworthiness of a piece of software, to evaluate the trustworthiness of a piece of hardware, right? Um, you need to know what the licensing is and where the encumbrances are or are not. So, so that's all chain of trust stuff. And then the fun, the penetration testing with Metasploit. Can I get a show of hands of anybody who's actually used Metasploit in the room? We've got a few people. Yeah, Kali Linux is, uh, which they call Linux, not GNU slash Linux. Um, Kali Linux is uh, very popular, and uh, a lot of folks are using that, and that's their first exposure to this world as well. And Metasploit is the primary toolkit on there. Um, I learned quite a bit. Uh, this, this Ingress lock backdoor I knew nothing about, uh, right? And so we showed people how to mess with IRC. And as lawyers using iPhones and iMessage and so on, to even know that something like IRC exists is really a wonderful thing if we can get people there. So more terminal. You guys didn't need to see more terminal. But um, and then we got into concepts, capped everything off, threat modeling at the end. Um, that's a little flipped. You know, when we do uh, privacy lab workshops and we're talking about digital self-defense, we usually start with the threat modeling, right? Um, but in this case, because we weren't talking about necessarily personal safety, right, um, I think it was important to kind of cap off with that after there was an understanding of what's out there. You can't do threat modeling if you don't know what a network is or, or you know, like what you're actually susceptible to if you don't know that you have a phone with massive amount of sensors gathering information about you, um, then how can you model, model threats or talk about operational security, right? And uh, final projects. We asked students to hack a device. And I know I'm using the word hack in the semi-negative way here. Um, so it's good that Richard is not in the back to yell at me. Um, <laughs> But um, what, what we mean, generally speaking, is if you want to do something playful, that's great. You can also demonstrate an actual real-world world exploit. This is one of those things I was a little worried about. <laughs> I was a little on the fence about now that we had uh, a classroom full of students um, learning free software, that they would wreak havoc at the university, and then free software would never be taught again, right? Um, that did not happen, which is great. Um, so uh, we got some awesome examples. Uh, we had the uh, students actually record themselves, so record their desktop as they were going through this, narrate. Um, I can share some of those in the etherpad, some of those videos as well. Um, but things like activating a microphone remotely to eavesdrop, um, that's extremely prescient, right? Uh, when you have things like the FaceTime bug going around. Um, cracking Wi-Fi access uh, point passwords. Uh, and doing this with stuff that's actually kind of difficult. You know, um, one of our students ran his computer for 16 hours through a, through a dictionary list. You know, huge list. I don't know how many megabytes, but it, uh, 
and, and was able to crack you know, a pretty robust password, um, WPA, too. So it's out there. We, you know, it's good for people to know and, and worry about, really. Um, and then there's the script kitty stuff, the website defacing, SQL injection, all of that. Um, that's really good because the client-server model, right, is something we need to talk about. As the world centralizes around the cloud and away from personal computing, I think that's also really essential to let folks know how susceptible a lot of these sites can be and how badly, poorly written some of these content management systems are as well. So, uh, the, Probably the best example, which we have up here, a uh, code sample uh, from one of the students. So keep in mind, we've got lawyers now writing Python to do some of this stuff, um, which to me is a huge leap that I didn't expect, but really exponential change in some of these students once they started digging in and actually using free software. Um, but uh, we had a, a, a student who was able to demonstrate how to spoof signatures by making one JPEG that was signed look like another JPEG that was signed from a signature standpoint. And it's because apparently there was an exploit a few years ago where um, Microsoft was allowing in Windows um, signature or cer sorry certificates to have MD5 hashes in them, and apparently um, the operating system would trust an MD5 hash that was actually in these as like a comment, you know, in these certificates, which I didn't I didn't even know about. So, so here, here's uh, us presenting that stuff. Um, at uh, Yale Cyber Forum, which was uh, last month. Um, and the students themselves now are, you know, teaching other lawyers, teaching other professionals, uh, policymakers. We had people in that room who are on, you know, White House staff from the Defense Department and so on and so forth, um, who are now seeing this stuff for the first time and going, wow, this guy just cracked a wireless access point in front of me um, using tools that are available to anyone. And that's the digital signatures. OK, now, I know the title of this is uh, Privacy and Security. And last year, I did a huge yeah. spiel about Yale Privacy Lab and what we do there. But I thought to cap off a little bit before questions, I would just get a little bit into that work. Um, we mainly started and still focus on uh, digital self-defense workshops there, what people used to call crypto parties, right? Um, and our version of it is a little more ad hoc. So if we think we have a group of folks that are interested in one specific topic, like we're going to do a bunch of freedom boxes in a room and run them on VMs, right, for everybody, um, we'll do that rather than going to, oh, worry about your password, you know. That kind of stuff we still do, but it depends on the crowd. We try to be very cognizant of our audience that way. Um, another thing we sort of fell into um, is mobile app analysis. Uh, we work with excellent folks at uh, Exodus Privacy in France, um, and we have some other people around the world, Australia and a few other places, um, who help us find tracker signatures, uh, primarily in Android um, SDKs. So um, that work has really skyrocketed quite a bit and is something we can demonstrate in front of people um, at a workshop to really get them interested in security and privacy. Um, and to be quite worried about proprietary-ish platforms like Android. Um, and that kind of feedback loop is really important because when you're teaching and you're going through these examples, you know, all of a sudden you'll see the light bulb go on in a student and it'll click, right? And they'll be asking about personal privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you need to be able to say, okay, we're talking right now about you know, pen testing or whatever we're doing, some exploit. But if you have a privacy question, we've got this workshop next week or at the end of the week or whatever. Um, so that's, that's a really powerful thing. And I recommend anybody who's doing this, if student groups want to copy our model or talk to me about ways they can do things like what we're doing um, at Yale, you know, that's a really wonderful thing to have these workshops on some sort of schedule. Um, and uh, yeah, demonstrating exploits. The feedback loop is very real. Now, not only can we just say, you should take our advice because we are people who know things, but we can actually show those exploits in some of these workshops. We can show plain text coming over the wire, and then we can show it being obfuscated and encrypted and why that keeps you safe, and then say, you should use GBG, right? 
here's why you should use GPG, because we can show you, um, we can show you the source of uh, an email and see that the message body is actually encrypted. Um, so. This is uh, Make Haven. These are freedom boxes that we just set up. Um, we are really expanding that, um, you know, trying to get as many of those online as possible. Um, sometimes they go online and offline because of the nature of single board computers. Um, we end up with SD cards getting fried for weird reasons and so on, but we're trying and we're, we're getting there. And this is a, a makerspace in New Haven. So building those bridges between a local makerspace or a local community of some kind and a university is also something we really want to do. So, And that's pretty much it for me. Um, I want to thank all of these wonderful people. Um, and uh, if you want to keep in touch, please go on that etherpad and uh, give me your information. And I'm happy to answer questions and so on later on down the line, too. And I'll be, obviously, around the conference. So uh, yeah, I'll take questions now. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic up to you. The exercise to start. Uh, I know you were saying that we have the long exposed theory of, all, of uh, having a lot of eyes making bugs shallow and the security audits. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've heard about all of these various major big holes in some of the major app things that we deploy on, um, and like HTTPS and so forth, and uh, wondering what your comment is on that. Sure, so um, that is the kind of thing that we try to explain when we say it's a baseline prerequisite, right? Um, but it does not mean that just because something is free software, it's secure. Um, we know there's been a number of major exploits because you have small teams with ancient code that's never checked, right? Um, and some of that has been extremely problematic. Um, we also know that people make mistakes, that when bugs are fixed, you create more bugs, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess my comment would be the reason we want to emphasize free software is we have at least mechanisms for verification by third-party folks. We have the ability to build up these teams um, who really, quite frankly, should be getting some sort of support from all of the corporations that are making massive amounts of money right, off of uh, this software. Uh, if they had that kind of support, if they had that kind of verification for every single piece of the stacks that we rely upon to run this huge thing called the internet, we'd be in a much better place. Um, the fundamental model works, right? But there will, of course, be exploits in free software. And as more and more people start using it, which is my hope, um, we're also going to see that GNU slash Linux is um, targeted more than it is now. So these boxes that have been running for I don't know how many years that nobody's upgraded are, uh, are going to be an issue eventually. So, Can you tell us more about your offerings or, or your relationship with Makerspace? Sure. So um, we're basically, we work with two makerspaces. One of them is on campus. That's the um, Yale CEID, or Center for Engineering, Innovation, and Design. Um, that one's available to students around campus. They go through like a very basic safety training. And then they um, have access to all kinds of beautiful, wonderful stuff, um, cutting edge machines. <laughs> um, they don't have a full dedication to free software course, um, so they have you know some stuff that is and some stuff that isn't, um, 3D printers that are proprietary and so on. Um, but we do workshops there, and we've been starting to do uh, workshops there um, demonstrating things like mobile app privacy by man in the middle of a phone and looking at the crap that a, an app is grabbing from some Android APK, right? Um, so. Um, that's one makerspace. And then the other one, Make Haven, is a little more organic. Um, that is a local space that started out very small um, in New Haven. And uh, I've been very active in even before I was active with Yale. Um, and we've grown quite a bit. Um, and basically, not only do we have very cool tools and a very nice space now, um, we have a very strong dedication to free software. Um, so. 
we use, you know, I don't know, Inkscape and those kinds of design tools when we're doing things like laser cutting, right? Um, and that allows, of course, my connection to Privacy Lab when we want to do workshops that are using, you know, I, I don't know, some kind of small network like those Freedom Boxes and playing around with that tech. Um, we can do it in a space like that, which I think is a good thing to expose people to. I'm trying to connect the community with a university that obviously is an Ivy League university that not everybody has access to, to put it mildly, unless you're able to pay to be on a crew team. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we try to make those connections. And our workshops have always been open to anybody who wants to walk in. So we, uh, we're happy to have folks in New Haven or elsewhere. Um, if you're in the area, stop by. Happy to show you around. Hi there. Um, so first of all, I wanted to plug, uh, if anybody's interested in a talk about defense in depth and how we can build a, uh, an ecosystem where not every app needs to be securely implemented and audited for us to be generally secure, I'm talking about that tomorrow. Uh, it's security by and for free software uh, at 4.20 p.m. tomorrow. So um, we'll have lots of discussion of that. And I wanted to ask you specifically, um, uh, if you have any recommendations for other people that want to succeed as you've succeeded in building uh, workshops that really reach out to the community and that get good gender parity and that include people that aren't in the normal techie circle that would come to a like security workshop. So I, I can't say um, for certain that we've reached that goal completely with workshops, right? Um, the, the Privacy Lab workshops, we do still tend to get quite a few techies who are interested. Um, postering around town is really good. Um, a little bit of fear mon mongering is not the worst thing in the world either. If there's been a big privacy exploit like the FaceTime thing and, and you can push that hard on a poster or on some online uh, campaign, social media, et cetera, you, know, you should because you'll get people in the door who are for the, for the first time seeing the direct impact of a security vulnerability in their lives, right? And then they'll want to, of course, talk about, oh, I guess I should have an ad blocker in my browser. I guess I should. And that kind of conversation you can now have with them, where before, eh, maybe they didn't care. Um, we want things to be more diverse, obviously, and, and get a, a group um, that is as you know, representative of the community as possible. Um, that's hard. You know, um, one of the reasons we do stuff at Make Haven, actually, or even we've done stuff elsewhere, we've been public library and so on, um, is because we want people who are afraid of going into, you know, an ivory tower-ish building um, to be able to uh, get these workshops and work with us. So, you know, it's not easy. And that talk is when tomorrow? Uh, 4.20 p.m. tomorrow. 4.20 p.m. tomorrow. Security ecosystem, right? Cool. Very cool. So I'd like to suggest that in addition to teaching security through free software, we should teach free software through security. Uh, nowadays, non-free software is probably malware, which means it's designed to be the opposite of secure. It's anti-security, worse than insecurity. And most people don't realize this, but every time you tell them about an instance of insecurity that had to do with some non-free software, teach them this is not just some rare accident, this is, has a systematic cause, which is software that the users don't control. With regard to the second of the maker spaces you mentioned, the one that has a free software uh, leaning, I wonder if it might be willing to adopt a formal commitment. It might be a very simple one, such as if we publish a design, it has to carry a free license. So now that's not a very strict commitment. It doesn't try to control all that much of everything, but it would go on record as saying we consider freedom an imperative. So um, I agree and wholeheartedly support that. That would be great. I will say I don't have the level of control I would like, <laughs> you know, to get people to do uh, what I think they should be doing, but I, I will try. Um, you know, in, in my backyard, when we do stuff, right, when we're doing a privacy lab thing, we make sure we're using free software and free software 
um, state an explicit policy that says we always do this because it's our principle? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good. On the website, we're very serious about it. Um, the point here and the point, you know, obviously I was trying to make is that um, we can get to folks through security, so you're right. Um, but we do make sure we're pushing the freedom aspect as well. Um, so we go into copy left, we go into all of that. Um, being able to replenish the commons is also, you know, from an ecosystem standpoint, right, something we need for global, just, I don't know, harmony, right? Um, if we're worried about the threat of cyber war, you know, that is something we also need to really contemplate. The more that we have proprietary lockdown code that can then be weaponized between states, uh, the more trouble we're going to be in. Thank you for the comments. That's great. Thanks for the great presentation, Sean. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question about the, the slide about Yale Privacy Lab. Uh, you said that you want to see more universities uh, copying that model, and I, I really want to see that too. Uh, so as someone who built the Yale Privacy Lab from the ground up, I, I want to ask you, what would somebody who wants to do what you did need to know before they start? Who do you need to talk to? Is it just the university IT? Is it the dean? Who, who, at, who in your, your school, in the university, do you need to get through to make something like this? I think those models are going to be different depending on where you are. So the first thing I'll say is um, I'm currently working on basically some foundational documentation saying if you want to do something like this at your university, here are the things we do that you may want to emulate, right? So I will write that stuff out about what we've found success with. Um, I'm not certain you can have sort of a catch-all talk to the dean, maybe it starts as a student group, maybe you get a sponsorship of faculty um, model. Uh, where we succeeded was because we were doing uh, things that gained trust, right? We were working with the legal clinics in the law school and uh, helping them communicate more uh, securely and more privately, right? And gaining that trust allowed us then to have a large leash, basically. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think uh, getting, getting a sponsorship, so to speak, from a faculty member is really helpful. The, the fact that we have this class now, the cybersecurity class, which I don't want to completely mix up as saying that is Yale Privacy Lab. Yale Privacy Lab is another, another thing, right? Um, but the fact that we have that feedback now and have faculty members actively, you know, engaged um, is really important and has been really helpful for us. Um, Regarding the IT situation, um, so far so good with us using things like Tor on the network. Um, there is no official policy at Yale for or against Tor. There are official policies against other technologies like BitTorrent. Um, so um, where there isn't a policy, I would say don't push on it because you may have the wrong, <laughs> wrong reaction. But uh, we've been able to um, use that technology without fear primarily by um, implementing it and showing people how to use it. Um, we've got now Tor Browser on all the kiosks in the uh, law library. Um, we've got obviously Tor nodes on the network. Um, we spin up uh, VMs all the time um, and, and have people actively using Tor. And when you can show people, and when everybody is your accomplice, <laughs> right, who's in the room, uh, it makes it very hard for that stuff to, to be, for there to be reactionary policy. Um, that said, treating um, the IT folks with respect is really important. Um, you may or may not cause problems for them that are understandable from their standpoint. Um, so I think working with them as much as possible is, is really, really important. You know, universities nowadays don't even um, allow public facing IPs usually. Um, and being able to get the trust of an IT person who will let you have your own subnet that the world can ping, you know, is a good thing. So I don't know if that quite answers, but I'm working on it. Sean, I came in a little late. Where can I get that pie image? Pie image? What are we talking about? Uh, oh, the actual the Raspberry Pi board? Image? Is that a pie? Oh, this right here, yeah. So this is running uh, Kali, GNU slash Linux, and then it uses a set of scripts um, from a project called um, Pyranalysis, like Pyranalysis. And then um, 
it's called a pyrogue because it's basically made to be a man in the middle. Um, I didn't actually really show it off, but it's right here if you want to check it out. Were you, you were actually kind of hinting at the fact that we just released a, an ISO image of an operating system, or, or no? We've got a Debian remix now, so maybe that's what you thought I was talking about? No, I, you know, I'm just really interested in images. Okay. You know, Marshall Wilbur, Linux Respin, I think yes. we talked before. Uh, are you using Triskel? Uh, so this is Triskel right here, but thank you very much. So we used your, um, Respin tool to um, take Debian and stick Tor and Signal and Wire and a bunch of other stuff um, on, on an ISO, and we do use that in workshops now. So That's thank, you. thank you. That's called Quillix. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>